emoji. That is sort of the how you're known. But um, it's you know four point five billion dollars. That's the recent valuation. So not bad. <laughs> um, but one of the biggest names in AI, so really it's great to, to have you here and a lot to dive into. I want to talk about sort of the evolution first of this company. You started as a chatbot for teenagers yeah. back in 2016, upgraded to building open source software, and now you're open sourcing large language models. Tell us a little bit about that evolution and where you sit in this whole AI landscape. Yes, our name is an emoji, the hugging face emoji. <laughs> it all actually started from a joke uh, with my co-founders where uh, we wanted to uh, become the first company to go public in the NASDAQ with an emoji instead of the three-letter ticker. Uh, we, we picked that name and this logo, uh, thinking that it would probably stay for a few weeks or a few months. Uh, but then the community, our users, started to like it, started to put it uh, everywhere, on their, on their shirt, on their, uh, on their clothes, on social media, uh, obviously, uh, and, and we decided to, to keep it. Uh, it's been a fun journey from, uh, as you mentioned, uh, starting with, uh, with uh, AI Tamagotchi uh, to where we are today as uh, the most used open platform for AI builders. Uh, so we have 5 million AI builders. So it's uh, like the machine learning engineers, the AI scientists, the software engineers that are building all sorts of uh, AI uh, features and products that are using us to find models, data sets, and build apps together. An open source. So there has been this debate between sort of the open source camp, which you're very much in, Meta is in, Mark Zuckerberg as well, that side, and then you have the closed source side of things. So OpenAI, Anthropic. How is open source doing versus some of the giants out there that are going on the closed source side? Can you give us sort of a status update? And is it taking off? Is there traction for open source? Yeah, uh, it's doing quite well. I uh, made a prediction, I think, in the end of uh, last year that uh, this year, open source models would be as good as proprietary models. And I think uh, it's, it's the case for most use cases. Uh, when we were trying to build a use case for your company, a specialized use case, uh, now the open source models are better than the proprietary models. Uh, you only want to use proprietary models most of the time for generic use case, when you're doing search, when you're doing chat GPT, which is like a very general use case. Mm -hmm for most of the other domains, not only in text, but also in image, in video, in biology, chemistry. There are now uh, amazing foundations in open source for you to really build AI. What kind of threat could that be to a company like OpenAI that we talk about a lot now, heading towards $150 billion valuation with a B? What does that mean you know, if, the, if there are cheaper models out there, open source like you're describing? Is that a threat, and does that put pressure on costs? I think it creates healthy competition. AI is a very kind of like foundational technology, and I think you don't want it only in the hands of a few companies. Mm -hmm. Like imagine if you had a world where only a few companies were able to do software. It would be kind of like a scary world. So I think uh, open source comes in as a way to create more competition, to give more organizations and more comp companies the uh, power to also build AI, build their own system that they control to make sure that they don't only rely on big technology companies. And part of that is access to chips and access to, to semiconductors. It feels like the tech giants have the deepest pockets. They have access to data. They have access to compute. You're actually leveling the playing field. Describe what you're doing with those chip clusters, too. That seems to be a, a big competitive advantage is just having access to chips. Yeah, there are very strong natural tendencies for concentration of power in AI, um, partly because of the compute need of, uh, of, of AI. A lot of uh, players in the field are trying to uh, change that. For example, we provide a shared infrastructure uh, for the whole ecosystem with something called uh, zero GPU, which are on-demand GPU that are shared across the community and across companies to be able to uh, make access to infrastructure uh, cheaper, uh, more flexible, and more in demand. How do your investors feel about that? We talk about some of the big tech players and maybe being the Goliath in this analogy of David and Goliath, but they're also backing an open source competitor. How do they talk to you about that? Yeah, we made a very intentional decision at our last round to actually add all the uh, big 
tech AI players in our cap table. So we're lucky to have uh, Google, NVIDIA, Amazon, uh, Intel, Qualcomm, um, in AMD in, uh, in our cap table. Uh, and we're trying to kind of like uh, work with them so that they can keep contributing to the field. So a lot of them are sharing, actually, open source models, open data sets, applications on the Hugging Face platform. And, um, and when you talk to them, you realize that they're all interested in the progress of the field, right? So in a way, open source AI is um, the, the tide that lifts all boats, right? So they understand that by contributing to that, they contribute to the development of the technology, which is ultimately good for them too. Another area that they're spending is talent. It seems like they're willing to spend billions in some cases to either acquire or bring people back. We've seen so many high profile executives that leave OpenAI, leave other companies. There has been this talent shuffle, for lack of a better word. What's your take on the talent advantage? How are you recruiting? And what's competition like with some of those biggest companies that really have a blank check when it comes to, to recruiting people? It's not as easy as uh, people think to build an AI company, um, to build it sustainably. Even kind of like the biggest AI companies uh, still are facing questions about the sustainability of their revenue, of their business models. So I think a lot of uh, uh, teams right now in AI are struggling. It also creates a lot of pressure for uh, founders or leadership teams at AI, AI companies. So I think it, uh, it leads to a little bit of this, this shuffle and this kind of like a, a faster uh, turnover within, within AI companies. We're seeing also uh, a lot of M&A activity on both sides, both on the acquire side and uh, on the acquiry side. So it's interesting to, to see in the next few months how it's going to evolve. I, I wouldn't be surprised if there would be much more M&A than before. Let's talk about regulation for a second. There was a big California bill that was seen as sort of potential de facto national legislation as well. It was vetoed. You were in support of that veto by Governor Newsom. Talk about why and where is there room for regulation? What do you think, how should, do you think the, the space should be regulated? Well, it's a hard trade-off between kind of like uh, not creating regulation that concentrates power even more, that uh, leads to regulatory capture but at the same time, uh, mitigating some of the risk and challenges of AI. So usually uh, what works well for foundational technology like that, similarly to uh, what has been done in software, is not to regulate the science, not to regulate the infrastructure, but regulate kind of like the final use cases, right? Uh, making sure that when AI is applied to a use case, it's applied for good. And so we usually support these kinds of regulation, especially when it pushes more uh, competition in AI, uh, more deconcentration of, of power, and more transparency for everyone to be able to build with it. That's really interesting. And regulating the applications, it seems like is what a lot of folks are arguing for. Um, part of that bill was something people were describing as a kill switch, that they could turn off some sort of model if it went rogue. Is that something you ever worry about? Is that something people in the audience should be thinking about? Sort of the worst case scenario? What's your, your take on, on the risk level of some of these models? I think we're pretty far from kind of like the, frankly, uh, sci-fi driven scenario of an AI Robocop that is going to take over the world. Um, right now, the main challenge is more like the people who are building using AI, right? The right way to approach the technology is really as a new paradigm to build technology. You had software, and now you have AI. Mm -hmm. uh, and so what's important is to keep focusing on the realistic risks of AI um, and keep doing research on maybe some very long-term catastrophic risks that maybe can happen in, in 10 years, in 20 years, in, in 50 years. Uh, but make sure that uh, it's not hypothetical scenarios that has very little science associated to it that influences all the decisions that we take today. What are the realistic risks? There's talk about bias, there's legal potential risks out there. I wonder the mini risk that you think about that's maybe more realistic. Misinformation, right? How AI can be used to, uh, uh, to manipulate. 
Um, by the way, something we, we rarely talk about is how uh, some of these chatbot companies are actually anthropomorphizing their chatbots and making them sound and look human, which in my opinion is a way to manipulate a little bit your users by uh, making them feel like they're talking to a human, even if they're talking to a technology system. Uh, you have challenges of, of biases, right? A lot of these systems are showing gender, racial biases, and, and many more that are seen in the, in the data sets that they're, they're trained on. Um, you have a lot of uh, uh, challenges uh, with transparency and education, right? You don't really understand how a model works, and so you don't, under don't understand the limitations. Mm -hmm. And so again, you can be manipulated by, by these systems. So these are some of the examples of practical challenges that are caused today by AI and that we can work on. I don't want to be too much of a Debbie Downer. We can talk about some of the, the potential upside. You brought up an example of IBM and what they're working on to help with climate change. I, I wonder just the, the silver lining here, because I think there's a lot of talk about doomsday. What are the near-term potential upsides for businesses and executives in this room? Maybe the, the upside, the more optimistic take on this. Uh, what do you think? There are a lot of very interesting use cases outside of text. Uh, we talk right now about, about text because of chat GPT and these applications. But when you look at AI for audio, for video, for biology, for chemistry, for time series, there are a lot of very positive impacts. So for example, last week on Hugging Face, uh, IBM and NASA released the first big climate foundation model which is going to be served, used as kind of like a, a way to improve climate prediction, for example, which uh, could save thousands of lives because on these events, when you can predict more accurately, maybe one hour earlier mm -hmm. than you would with the previous generation of technology, you can save countless of, of lives. So these are some examples of application of AI for good.